I'm delighted uh, to welcome into the Latte Lounge tonight Kate Bunyan, who is the Medical Director at Stella, uh, which is the online menopause clinic. So welcome, Kate. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Katie. Now, I thought I'd just tell everyone a little bit um, about you, if that's OK, before we, we um, start. Um, so Kate's drive is to make great healthcare accessible and easy to engage with wherever people need it. And she believes strongly that digital healthcare will enable this change. Kate has over 15 years of experience working for large multinational organisations, following an early NHS career and has a deep passion for transforming the healthcare landscape through bold innovation. Her work has seen her sell the seven seas as a cruise ship doctor, manage remote services, lead on international maritime health policy and provide medical services to events too. So again, Kate, you know, I'm really grateful um, you're here today um, because as I'm sure you're aware uh, from the women you see in your clinic, there's so much confusion, isn't there? And sort of misunderstanding um, when it comes to sort of supporting women um, with the right information and the best treatment options for, for perimenopause and menopause. There absolutely is, Katie. And um, I think I can also speak from very personal experience in just how complicated this journey can be for people. Um, having been diagnosed with early menopause myself earlier this year, and yet I've probably been symptomatic for a few years and I didn't spot it. I didn't see the signs. I was happy to put everything down to something else. So I think if, if I can, as a doctor, get this so wrong, as it were, then it's really easy for people to not quite know where to go, what to do. And so having this opportunity today to talk with you about some of those basics and then and exploring what women need to know and where to take things next if they've got thoughts and concerns about menopause is such an exciting opportunity to have. Well, I mean, absolutely. I mean, firstly, I'm very sorry to hear about um, your own early menopause. And I know that we're both, you know, a similar similar age when it started. So for, for myself, I was uh, 43. Obviously, now I'm um, 53. So um, I'm sort of 10 years on from when it all started. But, you know, it, it, it's, um, it can be really confusing because we're sort of part of this uh, sort of midlife um, sandwich generation. And you often put it down to juggling kids or, or work or, or aging parents or responsibilities and and you know I know myself I thought well I'm probably a bit overweight or I need to get fit so I'll try all these things and I think it's only when you realize that just nothing is making a difference and you're still feeling perhaps you know pretty rubbish which, which I certainly was that that you need to sort of dig a deep you know, a bit deeper. Now, um, obviously, there's no one size fits all approach. And it's so important to look at the woman holistically and see that overall general sort of health and well being in terms of, you know, as I said, nutrition, fitness, other health concerns, stress levels. Um, but last month, we did already uh, run another Facebook Live, which looked at the impact of our lifestyle on our symptoms. So today, I wanted to discuss the role of hormone replacement therapy um, and, and sort of look at where, when and, and how it plays a role in treating our symptoms. So I think before we talk about it, could you firstly explain what, what happens to our hormones as, as we age and why does that result in us, so many of us experiencing, you know, a whole host of seemingly unrelated symptoms? Yeah, so just taking it back to basics, essentially, if you are born with ovaries, your ovaries produce three key hormones that, that play a part in, in all this, and that's estradiol, the estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. So even in women, our, our ovaries are producing testosterone. Now, some of those are also produced in other parts of the body, but the majority of it is coming through our ovaries. And as we get older, our ovaries don't produce as much hormones. They don't respond as well to some of the other things going on in the brain that's sending signals to the ovaries to produce these hormones at the right times in our cycles to keep everything regulated. And as we get older, they just, the ovaries aren't responding in the same way. So we don't produce as much of these hormones. And when we head into that territory, we start to see the effect of not having as much estrogen predominantly we're talking about estrogen around our bodies and we have loads of estrogen receptors in lots of seemingly disparate parts of our bodies so we have estrogen receptors all over the show and that accounts for some of those symptoms that we experience that seem so very disconnected from the hot flushes through to the psychological difficulties through the joint issues the skin changes you know, you name it estrogen probably plays a part in it 
So as we see our estrogen levels start to decline, we see those symptoms start to increase. But the bit that the research just isn't clear on is why then isn't it the same for everybody? Why is there not a good link between a number related to how much estrogen you have and the symptoms that you get? And we don't necessarily understand that bit. So we can talk about in general terms that we have this change in our levels as we get older and that triggers those symptoms, but we still can't answer why some women will have more symptoms in some areas than others, even if we were to be able to look at their blood tests all the time and see them to be the same. Yeah, and it's interesting, isn't it? Because I, you know, experience things like brain fog and heart palpitations and anxiety and a dry, itchy skin and aching joints. And, you know, I seem to have, have sort of got a, drawn the short straw. Um, and then other friends of mine who were perhaps in the, you know, very similar state of health managed to sail through it and 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 it was you know it was quite frustrating for me and and for anyone watching I know from the sort of hundreds and thousands of messages and emails over the last six years that you often are made to feel like a bit of a failure or or a hypochondriac and you you kind of don't talk about it because of your fear of, of just you know not being able to sort of quote unquote just get on with it um, so, you know, for me, the missing piece in the jigsaw after four years of struggling and, and being sent from hundreds of different, well, not hundreds, but masses of different doctors and specialists, you know, the, the missing piece in the jigsaw was hormone replacement therapy. I'd never heard of the word perimenopause. It was a light bulb moment for me. And I hadn't really heard of hormone replacement therapy, even though my mum was actually pretty much one of the first people to ever be put on it. Um, so maybe you can start by sort of explaining what is hormone replacement therapy and then how does it work in terms of relieving symptoms for those that can or, or do need it or want to be on it? Yeah, absolutely. So hormone replacement therapy is exactly what it says on the tin. It's the replacement of the hormones that you're losing as you go through menopause. So we're particularly talking about estrogens and then progesterones as well. Maybe later, if we've got time, we'll touch on testosterone, but we'll focus on estrogen and progesterone for now. So with estrogen, what you're trying to do is provide a background level of estrogen as your natural resources start to, to wane off, if you like, so that you prevent some of those symptoms that happen because you've not got enough estrogen stimulating your system. So estrogens can be in the form of tablets, they can be in the form of gels, sprays, uh, that you can get vaginal estrogen. So we can talk about all the different variations, but essentially we're talking about being able to replace the estrogen component that your ovaries are no longer producing. The progesterone bit is because as well as not producing the estrogen, we know that we're not producing the progesterone, but if you have a uterus or certain conditions where you might have endometrium outside your uterus, so people with endometriosis, then you're at risk of the lining of the, the uterus, the endometrium, thickening if there's loads of estrogen going around your system. Now, naturally, we see that curve of estrogen and then progesterone, and that triggers us to have a cycle and that causes us to bleed and we shed the lining of the endometrium. So it goes back to its original thickness and then builds up again. If all you have is estrogen in your system all the time, it can just get thicker and thicker. Now that can cause bleeding, but it can also predispose you to certain types of endometrial cancers. And that's the bit that we really want to protect. So progesterone just helps to keep the thinness of the lining there so that we don't get that uncontrolled estrogen growth of the endometrium. Uh, so that's why if you are if you have a uterus and as I say, certain other conditions, then you'll have estrogen and progesterone as part of your HRT. Um, and can everybody, well, I was going to say before we get to, can everybody take it actually, what does it look like? I mean, what, what, what how, you know, I know a lot of women talk about patches and gels and pills and all sorts of different, uh, so, so maybe you can sort of describe, you know, what, what formulation it comes in. Yeah, so let's take the progesterone first. Most people will either be on a type of tablet progesterone, or they might have the marina coil, so a coil that's uh, impregnated with progesterone that sits in the uterus and that's that's discharging if you like it's east, it's progesterone locally so most people will have that if they're having their estrogen and their progesterone separately so if you're having your estrogen and your progesterone separately then you might have gels which looks like a gel it looks a, a bit like a a gloopy syrup um, that you then rub into your skin 
or you might have a spray that comes in a canister that you can spray on the skin, or you might have it in tablet form and they're usually just tiny tablets that you, you can take at the right dose. Patches will tend to be combined. So you've got the estrogen and the progesterone together, but there are loads of different preparations in all of these different categories. So finding exactly the one that works best for you can be a process of trial and improvement until you get to the, exactly the right combination. But in the patches, then you've got something that sticks on the skin and gently releases its concentration of the hormones into your skin continuously over a few days. So you would change those patches maybe twice a week, sort of on day three and day four. And you would probably just choose to change them on the same day every week, uh, especially if you're like me and have brain fog and memory challenges. Doing it the same time every week really does help. So just make sure you don't forget. Yeah. And, and can everybody take it? I mean, who would be a good candidate for this treatment? And obviously, how could it help them? And, and, and obviously, it'd be good to sort of touch on also women who have perhaps gone through surgical or chemical menopause or, or early menopause, especially for, for women, you know, under the age of 40. Yeah, absolutely. So the answer is that the majority of women can have HRT, but they may need some specialist discussions if they have particular types of problems that might lead them to have other complications uh, through their medical history that HRT might have an impact on. But the majority of women will be able to take HRT. Whether they need to take it or not is another question. That's where choice comes in and understanding what you want out of taking HRT. But we also know that HRT is very useful in women to help protect their bone density so to protect against osteoporosis and we also know that it's good for improving your cardiovascular health so your heart health and the, the health of your arteries and the system around your health so we know that even if you don't have huge symptoms from your menopause you may still get benefit in those long-term health areas uh, and there, there's good benefit shown with those so the answer is the majority of women can take it with some expect exceptions. And the a good candidate would be somebody who wants to be on HRT, who is happy to engage with their medical team on what's the right thing for them. And somebody who's, who's happy that it may not be right first time that they might need to go back, be honest about what's working, what's not, what might look better for them. And somebody that's willing to just play around with finding what fits best in their lifestyle because this isn't something you just take for a few weeks. This is something that you're going to be taking for a long time potentially. And so finding that right combination and working at it is gonna be really important. Now you mentioned early menopause and surgical menopause. For that particular group of women, HRT is really beneficial because of these long-term implications. So having sudden loss of estrogen, if you've had both your ovaries removed, for example, or both of your ovaries damaged from chemical therapy of some kind, or if you've had early menopause where your ovaries, for some other reason, stop working much earlier than a natural, what we regard at the moment as a natural menopause, then those individuals will be at increased risk from not having estrogens on board for a longer period of time. So that bone protection and that heart protection are really key in those people. So they're really encouraged and supported to be on HRT until the point where they might ordinarily expect to be menopausal, so in their early 50s. So we would really encourage that cohort of women to start on HRT and maintain their HRT into that time frame. Yeah. And, and you mentioned surgical menopause. I mean, I had a hysterectomy and had my ovaries removed. So I only need and do take uh, just estrogen because um, as, as we, we touched on, progesterone is to protect the womb lining if you do have a womb. And, um, you know, that's one of the questions we get asked a lot in our Facebook group. There's a lot of confusion as to, um, you know, why some women are only on estrogen and others are on both. So it is important to to kind of clear that up about you know why that that is um and i'm going through a list of regular questions so excuse me if it's not necessarily um in any particular order but i want to be sure i cover all the common questions that come again and again and again pretty much daily in the facebook group um one of them is what is the difference between body identical and bioidentical hrt that is a great question so Body identical means that the chemicals that we're using, the, the hormones we're using on a molecular level look the same as the molecular form in the body. 
So they are anticipated to work in exactly the same way they will mirror each other because they're molecularly the same. In a way, they are bioidentical, but because of how we now use the phrase bioidentical, it gets really murky. So we've taken to calling that body identical. They are matching your body. Bioidentical is a phrase that's now used for chemical compounds of personalized hormones where uh, an organization or a pharmacy will be trying to match your entire personal hormone profile to something that is identical to your particular biology. Now the challenge there is that these pharmacies are not regulated and the pattern of the way they put these hormones together isn't regulated. So these are not tested and they're not uh, regulated in the same way. So the safety profile of them isn't well known and it's not properly documented. So we would always recommend body identical, so that molecular base being the same, rather than this collection of highly personalized hormone profile, because we just don't know that they are safe. Yeah, um, um, that, that's quite important to, to make that clear, because I what I'm very keen about in um, the work I do, and on, of course, in the work you do, is that women don't spend a lot of time and perhaps waste money on you know especially you know when the sort of cost of living at the moment on on things that may or may not work and so um, body identical is is obviously prescribed by the NHS yes. and, and most good private uh, clinics and uh, as you say you know it's regulated and they've been tested for safety um now uh, there's a lot of misinformation and scaremongering, isn't there, around HRT. Um, now, I, you know, this is an area I talk a lot about. I'm very passionate about with, with a, a father who um, is a breast cancer professor, obviously now retired. It, it's it's information I've grown up with. So it doesn't surprise me. But for masses of women, they can't understand kind of where it's all gone wrong and why there's this still so much you know, frightening headlines, even though really, you know, that should have gone away. So maybe you could explain what went wrong and why that is. <laughs> <laughs> I can certainly try. So if we go back into the 1990s, there was a huge piece of work undertaken called the Women's Health Initiative Study. And initial early reports from that were published in 2002. Now, the way those initial reports were grabbed hold of and publicised in the media, both in the public press, but also in the medical press, led to some early reaction around the safety profile of HRT. Now, important to note here is that the way this study was constructed, it was not looking at the use of HRT as a, the way of relieving symptoms in menopause. It was set up for a different reason, looking at the long term health benefits for women in lots of different ways using estrogens that were tablet based and a much older form. You know, we are now going about 30 more plus years. Uh, so very different chemicals than we now use as our hormone body identical uh, hormones. So that's really where it all started. This misunderstanding of what the research seemed to be suggesting in the beginning and really a lack of huge trumpet blowing when the follow-up report came in 2013 of the long-term study showing all the benefits of HRT. And again, still very much in this focus group, these were asymptomatic women. They tended to have started the trial uh, later in life. They were looking at it for different outcomes, but even with that, it showed the benefits of HRT. So we've ended up with this very big study misrepresented and they're not really clarified when other stuff came forward. And then a lot of other research into menopause management uh, has been small numbers of people. It has been either great trials in very small numbers or less well-designed trials across larger numbers where we're drawing conclusions from. And it just hasn't attracted the same amount of information and support to get the messages out there as some of those negative messages in the beginning. And in the wealth of all the different research that's constantly coming downstream towards doctors, particularly when we're looking at primary care, when they are generalists and look at everything, it can be really difficult to tease out how you unlearn something that became well known as fact. And, and it's, it's a crying shame, but the reality is that we're now in a position where We've got a lot more attention, particularly at the moment. I mean, you're brilliant in what you do through the Latte Lounge at helping to bring 
factual information to people in a way that they can understand and start to do something with and start to question some of that assumption that has grown out of that very early misinformation nearly 20 years ago. Yeah, I mean, it's a crying shame. I feel like an entire generation of, of women have, be, have been let down, but we, we, we need, need to look forward. And that's why we've been doing so much sort of campaigning with the, the Make Menopause Matter uh, campaign with uh, my uh, lovely colleague, Diane Danzibring, which was all about, um, you know, sort of pushing for mandatory menopause training and catch-up training uh, for doctors. I mean, doctors do the most amazing job, but they only have these sort of 10 minute appointments with patients. And, and I think that's why it's so important that we all go as informed and educated as possible when we go to our doctors um, and, and hope that, um, that you know, they're as up to date as we are. Uh, and if they're not, it, you know, I always sort of say, you know, don't be afraid to sort of quote the nice guidance um, and, you know, be, be informed. So on, on that note, how can women make a joint sort of informed decision, you know, well, not just about their overall treatment options, but regarding these sort of benefit versus harms when they're having their um, appointments with a healthcare professional. I, th I think, again, really good conversation to have because we are very good as doctors. We tend to talk about shared decision making. But I think actually in the area of HRT, it's where we truly do do it as shared decision making in other areas when maybe people are more willing to, to just go on what the doctor might say or other areas where they, they already know exactly what they need and they're quite happy to just ask outright for it and it's, it's fine to just get on and prescribe it. But with HRT, there are some risks and you're, we're talking a lot about the unknown. So we know quite a lot about the short term and we know it in specific areas. So we know it around transdermal, so patches and gels and the risk of clots, for example, or the benefits on osteoporosis prevention. So we know certain pieces of information, but we get more hazy the longer we leave people on it and the longer after menopause that people start their HRT. So we don't actually have the tools medically to be able to say, well, your risk is this if you do this and it's this if you do that. It's much more about relative risk. It's, well, we all live with risk every day. We all come with our own inherent risks because of the way we lead our lives, our genetics, the environment we've grown up in, all sorts of things, some in our control, some not. So the rest of it is then about nuancing what comes on top of that. So what can we do when we go into our appointments? You know, I was exactly the same. I had no idea I was going to see my deep GP regularly for my worsening migraines uh, and was terrified of talking to anybody about the paranoia I was experiencing. Um, and it's only when I started joining the dots, I was like, oh, hang on. This might be something going on. But in fact, for me, it was fertility investigations that was finally what shined the light on it. I did not see it until I was failing to conceive. And then at that point, it was okay, right, I need to do some reading. And I'm an A&E doctor originally by background. How do I bring myself up to speed? So learning about sort of the green climatric scale. So you can get, Stella has a, a version of it within our app. You can find it online. You can see it in the NICE guidance all the questions and the symptoms. So where am I? What, what do I have? What's severe? What am I hoping to get better from? What are the outcomes I'm looking for? And actually shape up what you want that conversation to look like. I find that in my practice and with many of my colleagues, actually having a patient that sits down and just comes armed with, I want to have this conversation with you. And this is what I've got to say. This is, this is the outpouring that I've got. What do you make of it? That's really heartwarming I love being in that position where we can then have a conversation about okay I won't have all the answers that can fix it with just saying it's not like an antibiotic for a chest infection you know, this is going to be a process and when I spoke to my gynecologist that was exactly what she said I'm going to need you to work with me until we find what's right for you so it's again understanding so what should I expect to side effects what should I expect in terms of how long it takes to work what if it's not working for me? Is that the end of the road? So information, I think, is really vital. And there are some great sources of information out there. Obviously, I think Stella's got some brilliant information. The Latte Lounge has great information. It's about finding those resources that you trust and using those to help inform the conversation you want to have with your doctor. Yeah, I mean that that's so so true, isn't it? And and I think it's it's having that confidence, isn't it, to 
actually prepare a bit ahead of your doctor's appointment. I mean, we always say, you know, at the bare minimum print offer, uh, we have a free downloadable symptom checklist. I know the Stella app um, has um, a, a symptom, well, a symptom checker at the beginning when that when people sign up so that to understand what's going on. And I think that's really helpful to start off with just sort of understanding yourself that, oh, actually, maybe it's this it may not be but it could well be and then um perhaps you know going um ringing up before you go to a doctor and actually saying well you know is there a doctor who specializes in menopause or has a special interest in women's health um yeah. before before you go so i mean how do you've sort of taught um very loosely about things like formulation but how do you actually go about asking for it and being prescribed it so it's sort of take us through that next step so once you've had that discussion um you've weighed up the benefits versus the harms and your own personal risk and you think you know what i'm actually in really good health um other than that so this is something i want to do i understand um the risks and they're very low for me so what happens next in a consultation so depending on the background of your particular clinician, and I also think that there's a huge number of nurses that are now running the menopause clinics in uh, primary care um, who are equally as well upskilled as GPs with, with specialist interests. So you may find that that's where you get directed within your practice. Uh, so then it's going to come down to they may have a prescribing formulary that their area uh, tends to go with. So they are likely to offer transdermal first. So patches or gels because we know they have the lowest risk profile and they're going to want a conversation with you as to what format would you like your progesterone in if that's still relevant to you so is a marina coil something that you would like is that going to fit with the rest of of your lifestyle and the, the sort of feelings you have around whether you want periods still while you're still having periods how does that work so get the progesterone bit straight because if you're going to have a coil fitted then you don't need any other form of progesterone you've got that sorted, the, the marina coil. Then it's gonna be, well, how do you want to use it? Are you somebody that likes to go swimming first thing in the morning, in which case needing to get a gel on to dry for a while and then leave it for an hour before you get wet may not suit you. A patch might be perfect. Are you somebody that can remember to do everything this, at the same time roughly every day? Or is something that you change just twice a week much more convenient for you? Do you like the reliability of a tablet? Maybe for you, tablets would be easier. And if your risk profile is such, then maybe that's the right thing. So again, part of it's going to be about personal choice and what you think fits into your life. So I use Sandrina gel um, and I have my little routine um, and I'm on testosterone as well. So I've got, got my where how I use it, where I put it on and it just works fine. I've got my routine and I've got my rhythm. On the morning where I go to the gym, I will put it on and then I know that when I come home, I've still got to wait an hour before I have my shower. So I've got that again, baked into my routine. Do I think that maybe I might want to try patches? Well, maybe I might, but right now I'm feeling really confident with the way my prescription's working. So I'm happy to stick at this for a while and just let that settle down for a bit. So understanding what sort of preparation you like, are you somebody that's gonna to want to rub it into your legs and, and into your stomach every day? Or are you somebody that would prefer a tablet if that works for you? Would a patch be more convenient? Those are the sorts of things you're going to be thinking through. And your practice are likely to help support you in what they have available in terms of the what they can offer from their formulary um, and then tailor it. And ideally, you want the lowest possible dose that does what you're looking for. So you want the lowest dose that's going to sort your symptoms out and give you the protective benefits, particularly around that osteoporosis risk. So we don't start high. We tend to start low and then build up. Well, well, only because um, it's very, very relevant. There's a question um, in, from one of our uh, women who are watching in the Zoom now, um, and you've, you've pretty much sort of answered it. But the question was, is there an optimal level of estradiol in the body to protect women's bones? So we don't know exactly what the right number is because estradiol is really difficult to biochemically map because it fluctuates even in the perimenopause even in postmenopause it still fluctuates um so yes we know where we see a better benefit in bone protection and, and uh, osteoporosis prevention uh, and so we have a starting threshold for that and we also know that women who have been on hrt particularly if their menopause has started earlier or their symptoms have started earlier 
um, and use it for five years, we know that that in itself can be protected, even if that's as long as you use it for. We know that the, the onwards benefit seems to outlive the length of time that you from when you stop the, the HRT. Yeah. Um, 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 what happens if you've had a history, perhaps, of blood clots in the past? Um, would you still, would you change what you would offer in terms of formulation? Yeah, you, you would. Um, so again, it's going to be a very much that shared decision making and having that conversation. This is another area where being clear on your family history is also very useful because it helps us to understand whether there are other things at play within your genetics that might make things more complicated. So there is no doubt that oral uh, tablet estrogen does have a, a higher risk with people who've had, had clots. It increases your risk of having clots. But we know that the gels and the sprays don't carry that same risk. But it's going to be a shared decision. So it's going to be that conversation of what are you hoping to get and what is your risk? Is this something that a clot that you had three months ago, in which case your whole body is still at risk of clots and anything in, in addition to that probably isn't a good idea right now? Or is this something that happened for a very, very clear reason 20 years ago and nobody else in your family has that problem? Now you may find that your GP wants to get specialist advice and input on decisions like that because it is quite nuanced and it is going to be very def definitely different for different people and will be totally dependent on their particular circumstances. But we do know that it is not an absolute contraindication to having HRT. If your symptoms are really bad and your risk is such that you are happy with the, the benefits versus those risks with somebody that understands and can translate those risks into your setting, then it's perfectly possible to have HRT. Yeah. Um, I'm just looking down as I'm not not listening to you, but there's just a question coming from the Facebook group, which is, is relevant actually to my next question. Um, a lady called Emma Davis has asked, I've heard that if you're on HRT, you should have regular blood tests. Um, is this correct? Now, now, the reason why I wanted to bring that in, up is because so many women often say in, in the Facebook group, and, and I wanted to know my, myself, how long before you're going to feel different or how do you know if you're actually absorbing it well enough and if you know and, and if your symptoms are not controlled so um can we sort of touch on that like um you know how how do you know and how often should you be checked up so the answer to the question about blood tests is that apart from in the management of testosterone and some cases of early menopause we don't recommend blood tests because there is no clear blood test that says I am now menopausal. And even if you are looking at hormone profiles, they fluctuate during the day, they fluctuate day to day. Catching it right to be diagnostic is almost impossible to be of use to us in most circumstances. So how do you know when it's working enough and whether you need to change? Well, we, the rule of thumb is about three. So when you start on HRT, we would recommend that you continue with the preparation that you've been started on for three months to see how it's getting on now you may some women will find an almost instant relief to some of their symptoms some of the symptoms like the psychological symptoms can take longer to start to feel better from some women will feel instantly better from that point of view just because they feel listened to and they know that they're on the path to recovery and that in itself can have positive benefits uh, to an, any individual so it's a, again, there's no hard and fast six weeks or out. We would tend to look at it every three months, but we may need to look at it every three months and iterate until we've seen a, an improvement. We do know that there are some women who really struggle to absorb certain types of preparation. So in those cases, you will you would go on whether your symptoms have got better. If your symptoms aren't better, then even if we took a blood test, it's you that we need to treat it's not the numbers so at that point we need to think about are you on the right dose or actually are you on the right preparation for you do we need to tinker with that I had problems during uh, the summer um, as so many women did getting the preparation I'd been started on I changed preparation three times some of those I didn't get on with at all some of them were better than others so again different people will respond in different ways and it's going to be about finding that going back and, and continuing that loop until you've got what's working for you and controlling your symptoms 
that's how we know that it's doing what it needs to do. Yeah. Now, um, a, a very common question that everyone um, often asks me is how long can you or should you stay on HRT? And, and I guess what are the pros and cons? Um, you know, because I, mean, I, I know women, you know, who are in their 80s who are still on it and doing brilliantly and are terrified to come off it. And then I know other women who have been doing really, really well. And for some bizarre reason, which I can't understand, they, they've suddenly been advised to just come off it because they've been on it for you know maybe four or five years and, and they, they don't want to so yeah. is, is there a sort of time limit um short answer no but there is a long answer to this as well so the guidance is that there is no arbitrary time frame to take people off hrt so when you're on it you can be on it as long as you need to be on it but it should be reviewed with you every year is it still meeting your needs and having the desired effect for you and your menopause journey there is one but around progesterone. So if you are somebody who is having cyclical progesterone, so you just have progesterone on certain days to map against your estrogen, and so you're having a withdrawal bleed, much like you would do with the combined oral contraceptive pill, then we know that after five years, you really ought to move on to a continuous progesterone. Uh, and that might, again, could be marina coil, it might be a continuous format of whatever you've been having previously. Um, but we do know that about after five years, and that's something that should be looked at, but you should only be moving to continuous if you have reached the post-menopausal period. So if you have completed your menopause and you're no longer having bleeds. So again, that would be something that, that the doctor would work through with you. So it's not about coming off HRT, it's just making sure that we're mapping the right HRT for the stage of your journey. Mm. And then when we're looking at, well, what, what are you looking to get out of it? It may be that it's about progression to different types of HRT. So it may be that actually your systemic symptoms, your hot flushes, your brain fog, maybe you've been fortunate and after seven years of management on HRT, actually those problems are resolved. And if you were to come off HRT, you don't have those symptoms anymore. But maybe you do have really profound urogenital symptoms. So problems in the skin around your vagina uh, and around your urethra, your urethra and your bladder causing all sorts of problems there well local estrogen vaginal estrogens could be exactly what you need and you can be on those forever in a day so it may be about transitioning the type of estrogen again to map to your symptoms your journey and what's best for you so there are, there's no hard and fast you don't need to come off it at any particular time we are more cautious about starting HRT in someone who is more than 10 years post menopause, so post their last period, because again, it's the safety window, it's the understanding what's going on and whether it is safe to start somebody on estrogen who has effectively had very low estrogens because they've already been through their menopause journey for such a long period to then suddenly put them on estrogen could put them into new risks that we don't fully understand. So there's the window of when can I start, but not when can I stop. Mm. And, and I'm glad you mentioned uh, vaginal estrogen because actually, believe it or not, the probably the most read article on our website has been about vaginal atrophy. And that was a word I'd never heard of, but vaginal dryness and vaginal atrophy is so common. And yet it's the most embarrassing taboo area. And a lot of women are just so embarrassed or they just think it's literally just them um, and they don't want to talk about it. And, and some people just get diagnosed with thrush and they keep trying to treat it with, with sort of canister or whatever preparations for thrush cream. So it is really important for, for women to know that this is you know yet another symptom that's due to this lack of estrogen and that as you say vaginal estrogen is very safe and um, now is well one I know one preparation Gina is available over the counter without prescription so um, yeah you know again just it's all about being educated and informed now we um, I would like to I know we don't have that long but I would like to ask you about testosterone because I had never um, heard that testosterone was a female hormone, which obviously I now know a lot about. And a lot of women are terrified thinking, oh my God, I don't want to grow a beard and, <laughs> um, you know, and I don't want my voice to go deeper. So can you just tell us about testosterone? What part does it play in, in, in the female biology? And, and, and do we lose it in the same way we lose estrogen and progesterone? And, and, and what does it do, um, you know, to, and maybe it's the missing piece in the jigsaw for some women who are watching now. 
Yeah, and gosh, we we could probably spend an entire hour just talking about testosterone and to a certain extent talking about what we don't know about testosterone, because this is definitely another of those areas where in women it hasn't been well researched. And in fact, at the moment, there is a call to do more research exactly in this area. But we know that testosterone does fall off in the same way that it does uh, with other hormones produced by the ovaries. And so we know that we do see that that reduction in testosterone. What is absolutely unclear is what is the connection between how much testosterone you've got in your system as a woman and what symptoms you might experience. We do know that those with low testosterone in their premenopausal years are going to show signs of low sexual desire, low libido, uh, difficulty in having orgasms. So we know that that is something that happens in low testosterone premenopausal, and we believe it is also the same in those who are postmenopausal in some cases. But libido and all that goes with sexual health is such a complicated area, and it is definitely not as straightforward as having testosterone and everything gets better in the bedroom, either with yourself or with a partner. We know that it can be really complicated. We also know that if you have testosterone and you don't have the right amount for your body of estrogen, then the testosterone gets converted into estrogen. So you don't get any additional testosterone effect. What you get is a sorting out of your estrogen levels. So testosterone is something that we talk about with women who are already having good symptomatic relief of their hot flushes often, their night sweats, hot flushes, their vasomotor symptoms, because that tends to be a good indicator of having enough estrogen on board. And when that's still the case and you do still have low libido that is impacting you in a way that you are not happy with, then testosterone undoubtedly has a role to play there. And there's certainly indication and research that says testosterone in that case is useful. What we know less about is whether testosterone is useful for other symptoms of menopause. Those who end up taking testosterone for low libido will often also say, I've seen an improvement in this, that and the other type symptom, but that is much less well researched And I'd say that's where there's a call to get more research as to actually how broad might the testosterone effect be for women who are menopausal. One of the really difficult things in the UK is that we don't have any testosterone preparations for women. So there isn't anything that you can get that is licensed for use in women. So whenever anybody's prescribed testosterone, it is what we describe as off license. That doesn't mean it's illegal. It doesn't mean that it's bad. Nothing of the sort. It is definitely well documented to use it in this way but it means that the license that is granted for that medication to be prescribed freely isn't there so we're asking people to prescribe it off license now we do off license prescribing for lots of different reasons quite frequently children's prescriptions are a really good example where we will often prescribe things that we are know are perfectly safe for children but it's off license so that is one of the roles of a doctor is to determine what's the right thing But if you're having something prescribed that's off license, you do need to make sure you're having a good conversation with people about what the risks and benefits are so that people do understand that. Because part of it being off license is because it's not as well researched in this particular area. But the fact that you're being prescribed, it shows that it is researched sufficiently to know that it's safe and useful in this area. So testosterone will be prescribed to those who are already well estrogenized. So those who have got good control of other parts of their symptoms still have low libido that they would like better controlling. But alongside that, I'd come back to vaginal health again, very strongly. That vaginal atrophy, the dryness, the irritation, the recurrent, seemingly recurrent infections that may or may not actually be infections that may be symptoms associated with vaginal atrophy. Those are always going to impact your sex drive, because if it's sore and uncomfortable, you're not going to be wanting to go there. So making sure that you've got all of those things sorted out and also thinking about the psychological impacts is also really important too. So just testosterone alone is unlikely to be what just happened. You're unlikely to just get a prescription for it. It should be part of a much bigger conversation about how it all fits together in this package of good health. Yeah. And, you know, sadly, there's still such a fight to to get it, even if you, you know, you know about it and, and ask for it. And I know myself, my 
Um, I actually got a prescription from my doctor, but my pharmacist refused to give it to me because he had never heard anyone ask for it before. And, um, and, and that's a shame. But, you know, I think having these sorts of conversations and raising awareness and, um, you know, I know the Stella app has lots of information and we have a great article as well on our website about testosterone. And again, just be informed and read up about it um, because obviously you know, information is power. So um, I've got um, just two more questions I want to ask you. Um, one relating going back to vaginal atrophy. Um, one of the ladies who's watching the Zoom tonight has said um, how many, um, so if you're a vaginal tablet like uh, Vagifem, which is one of the um, brand names, um, how many um, should a woman take a week? Is there a sort of, um, you know, is, is there a, is it a once a day or twice a week or does it depend on each person? So to a certain extent, it depends, but also read the instructions that are, that are on the packet. Right. Thinking about daily moisturizers, though. So you've got your estrogens that you can use, but you can also use daily moisturizers. And by moisturizers, we're thinking of those things that are not going to add irritation. So this isn't that your face moisturizer. Um, one of the ones that I, I know um, a doctor who specializes in this area really recommends is coconut oil. You can buy it in the supermarket, um, but coconut oil, used as a moisturizer can be incredibly beneficial to help heal the skin and keep on top and then for some people they're also going to need additional treatment so this is one of those areas where self-medicating isn't necessarily a great idea speak to your doctor again it is it is definitely one of those things where you have to pluck up the courage to be able to go and, and have a chat about the fact that it's very uncomfortable there and that they need to look but you want to make sure that you're being treated appropriately with vaginal estrogens you may need steroids if, if you have particularly difficult atrophy and moisturizers all the time to just really help uh, keep everything healthy and keep the integrity of the skin. Yeah, absolutely. And, and a lot of women also use um, vaginal lubricants as well. And there's yeah. lots of conversations about that on our on our website and, and in the Facebook group. Um, can, can women get it free on the NHS at the moment? And if not, um, you know, what are the sort of other options for, for those that are just not able to get it free or or perhaps can't afford it or perhaps just there's such a long waiting list that they would rather just go privately and, and get it sorted quicker? So sadly, it's not free. And at the moment, women have to pay for each prescription in the same way you you're paying for any other prescription. So nine pounds, however much it is right now per item per however frequently you're prescribed. Some GP practices will be brilliant. They'll prescribe six months in a, at a time. Some will be limited to three months at a time. Um, sometimes you'll need only a month prescribing because you are iterating and trying to find the right thing and you're, you're cycling through changes. Coming next year, and we hope it's going to be April 23, there will be a prepayment certificate which enables you to pay a one-off charge and that will cover all your HRT needs for the year. So that is going to be a way of capping the cost. And it is likely to be around this sort of £18.70, or that is what is being spoken of at the moment. We recognise we are in very dynamic times, and this is in part a political decision. So that's what we're hoping is going to have, which at least will help women have a clear plan of how much it's going to cost through the NHS. Yeah. But you're right, for some women, getting hold of their GP is challenging at the moment. We are all aware of the pressures in the system. And for some people, they just don't want this to be what takes them to their GP. Uh, so looking at private options is, is also a, a possibility. So there are lots of private menopause clinics that you can go to. And that's usually about sort of in the region of sort of £250 for an appointment. And then you'll need to pay for your medications and the prescription charges on top of that. So you're usually looking at maybe 30 to £40 pounds for the prescription and then between 10 and 35 pounds per item for the, the medications that you're then prescribed. There'll then be follow-up consultations, which are usually a little bit cheaper, but those are the sorts of costs you're looking at. What we've done with Stella is provide an online for, format for being able to prescribe HRT um, and a whole clinic approach uh, that includes consultations with menopause doctors if that's what you need. And that's at a sub subscription price of £45 a month, and that includes all your HRT needs as well. I mean, th that that's music to my ears because what I, what I'm very, what I find very frustrating is that we, as I've said, we just have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of women who are desperately looking for help and are not either not getting help by their 
uh, GPs, or the GPs are perhaps saying, look, I'd like to refer you to a menopause specialist. And then there are these very, very long wait lists just because there is so much demand now, or just because, you know, the pressures on the NHS we all know about. Uh, um, um, can you just maybe quickly tell us before we wrap up a little bit more about the Stella um, app and, and the service and, and what people can expect, um, especially in terms of being able to have a consultation with a prescribing doctor? How would that look? Yeah, so um, I mean, we're really proud of what, what we're able to offer women, because what we're able to now do is, is take a history from women in their own time. So they're able to answer a series of questions. It's a very in-depth questionnaire that's going to cover their personal history, their medical history, their family history, and everything about their symptoms, uh, so that we can get a real clear picture of what's going on for this woman, what are her concerns, where are her symptoms. Uh, and then from that, we can also ascertain, is it safe to prescribe HRT uh, as a almost automated process? So for those women who have symptoms that are consistent with menopause and no re reasons why they shouldn't be prescribed HRT as a, as a simple process, then that can go through to our prescribing uh, team and they can prescribe HRT on request in that way. So we give women an opportunity to say what they would like out of safe options for them and then that can then be posted out to them. So we have that journey that can just wrap up everything without them even needing to speak to a doctor if they've been able to give us all the information that we need to make that safe prescribing decision. But we know for many women, there is a reason why they might need to speak to a doctor. Um, and for some women, it's just that they want to be able to speak to a doctor. And so for that, we also have the ability to book in with one of our menopause specialists who are then able to speak to the, the patient online. So much like this conversation, you can have a medical consultation that's private and secure uh, to then engage with the doctor about your menopause symptoms. So very specifically looking at your menopause care. And then we offer 20 to 30 minute appointments to be able to talk through that. And again, we can issue the prescriptions out the back of that. And that might be suitable for people who are new to HRT, but also for those who are in, on HRT, but looking to change things around or want to explore what other options might be available to them. Uh, so we're delighted to be able to offer that opportunity for people to have their HRT posted to them, knowing that it is safe and appropriate for them, either directly after answering the questions or through a consultation with the doctor. And I assume that um, there, then there would be a, ch a checkup as well to see how they're getting on once they've started and any questions, which, which is why this is this is such a, a fantastic um, new uh, idea and I'm actually delighted about it because it's funny what we do in the Latte Lounge is the, the, the pillars are support, inform and signpost and we often signpost women off to whether it's the British Menopause Society website or to various specialists but I never have any idea where that journey goes and, and sort of how they are and if they're getting the help and and I always feel dreadful that you know women who you know can't afford to to pay those sort of huge prices of of a you know one-off consultation plus you know the then prescriptions that you know they're, they're sort of saving up for something that really you know shouldn't be such a struggle so you know hats off to, to Stella for sort of coming up with this and obviously we're really delighted to uh, be working with you guys um um, so really, Kate, this has been a brilliant conversation. I mean, and we could go on for hours and there is so much, <laughs> there is so much to unpack here. But for everyone watching, I, I really hope you found that helpful. I hope I answered all your questions. Thank you for sending them in. Um, and again, if there are any other questions that we haven't answered, um, please email me at hello at lattylounge.co.uk. Um, and obviously, um, you know, I will share it with the team at Stella and do check out um, their new fabulous app and, and let me know what, what you think of it because um, I, I've certainly downloaded it and I'm finding it very helpful myself. So um, Kate, again, thank you for giving up your time tonight. Um, much appreciated. Thank you. All right. Be well, everyone, and take care, and we'll see you in the Latte Lounge soon. Bye.